Morning guys, I'm Dr. Ken Norbert again with another fireside seminar for you. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about deer droppings or scats or whatever you want to call them, but droppings. Before I start though, uh, you know, a lot of you guys are reclusive now because of the coronavirus. You know, we're sitting around home wondering what to do. I've noticed a real big increase all of a sudden in the last few days in numbers of people watching my uh, YouTube seminars and uh, telling me that there's a lot more of you now have more time to be watching. And that's great. Uh, this is a good time. If there's one good thing about this virus and having to stay home and being laid off or, you know, uh, during this period, which can last, I've heard estimates anywhere from a month to well, much later. I hope it isn't that way, but certainly we'll be through all this before deer season starts. <laughs> so what you learn here now is going to do you a lot of good during the coming hunting season. Uh, last week, uh, my last seminar, I talked to you about deer tracks and what an important part deer tracks play in buck hunting. Uh, they're the key to uh, to hunting older bucks. You know, if every day, every half day, you're out in the woods during your deer hunting season, and you're very close to tracks made by a big buck within the minutes or an hour right before you arrived, or you, you or you hunt in a place where you're almost certain the big buck is going to come back later today or tomorrow morning you're in the ballpark, That's, you're going to start seeing a lot of big bucks. But tracks are not always easily available. <laughs> Deer signs. Good morning. It's the 12th day of our deer season. <laughs> Actually the 12th day that we've been up here in our deer country and we're breaking camp. I can't believe 12 days can go so fast. I always hate to have to go home, but the time has come. It's been a strange season. There was hardly a day this year so far during our hunting season that the temperature wasn't up in the 60s, sometimes even got into the 70s, which is really unusual. And that's not good for deer hunting. Our whitetails up here uh, are ready for winter. Their winter coats are fully formed uh, they survive 45 degrees below zero up in this country during the winter. We're just a few miles from the Canadian border here. Uh, when it gets that warm, they don't want to do anything. They just want to lay in the shade somewhere and they refuse to move. We don't see many deer. And that compounds the fact that our deer numbers are way down this year. About five years ago, we had a severe winter and we lost nine does and quite a number of of uh, younger bucks as well. And they really haven't recovered. Warm weather and strong winds. We had many days when the winds were over 15 miles an hour, which is usually the turning point. Deer don't like to be out moving around when the winds are strong because there's so much noise in the woods. And as you notice, here we are in the far north and we have no snow. With that warm weather, no snow. In fact, we only had a little bit of rain once during the season. No snow at all, which made it nearly impossible for us to use our special hunting method uh, called opportunistic stand hunting. We need snow for that. We need to be able to find tracks wherever we go and be able to distinguish whether they're fresh or not. Well, this year, what we had to do is depend on finding fresh doe droppings because. Breeding is in, in progress. Breeding started on November 3rd in this area. And so we figured the only way we're going to see big bucks is to stick close to does. And the only way to stick close to does is to find their very fresh droppings, still shiny. And uh, so that's what we've been doing. But it's been tough, I'll tell you. Especially for this old man. You know, I'm 81 and uh, I had open heart surgery last April <laughs> and here I am so I, I suppose I could say well these are all good reasons why the Nordberg gang didn't do so well this year but surprise <laughs> we, we've done really well 
Uh, so far, I've got I've got a son and a grandson who are pretty good deer hunters out in the woods right now this morning. Haven't heard a shot yet, but if they get one this morning, that'll be number four. Despite the the low number of deer, about six per square mile here, and despite the fact that last Monday. Uh, when my son was having a problem with his vehicle, we had to put in new bearings in the right front. And where we were hearing a lot of hunters saying, uh, there's no more deer up here, the wolves have eaten. Oh, <laughs> we might as well go home because they hadn't been seeing any. Been very few shots in this country this season. Really quiet, really strange compared to back in 1990. Uh, but the Nordbergs have done all right. We've got three bucks. Uh, one is young, it's a, it's a yearling. Uh, We've got a two and a half year old uh, five pointer, and then we got a three and a half year old eight, uh, eight pointer. Nice buck. So, the Nordbergs didn't do too bad this year. We're pretty good at hunting bucks, and we continue to be good even under these adverse conditions. Well, we'll talk to you more about these things in the future videos. You know, this kind of research might help you guys down south where you hardly ever get snow for deer hunting. But keep in mind, fresh deer droppings have been the key this year. That's a good key to start with. So, thanks for, thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. I know, like, uh, you know, in spring scouting, they, well, their tracks are, you see tracks everywhere, nice, measurable tracks. but. In the fall, you know, you get out there in September and October scouting and vegetation is deep and when you get to the point where leaves are falling and they're covering deer trails all over the place, it can be kind of hard to find a deer truck. I've seen that happen quite a few times over the years. Get out there in mid-October and, you know, getting ready for the firearm season in November and you can hardly find a track sometimes. But somehow, droppings are always there somewhere. They, uh, I, I've seen hunting seasons where all we could find were, as far as signs made by big bucks were, were droppings. And somehow, we always find them somewhere. Not always a lot, but sometimes it doesn't take many. You know, I, I can remember quite a few hunting seasons where the only thing I found before the season began to tell me a big buck uses this trail or, or, or this feeding area or maybe this watering spot over here or maybe like up where we are in the Canadian Shield Country, a little basin, the water is fed by a spring and there's big droppings close to it, so old and fresh, that can be a valuable find. But more than once I've found uh, I'll be on a trail and geez, here's what I've been looking for all day. Some huge droppings. There's some that are inch long, shiny, clumped. Big buck. Boy, that's a big buck. That's using that trail, at least right now, and it, the feeding area is right over here. So the feeding area I can call it uh, as being a place where you're going to see a big buck. He's got to eat twice a day, whether he's with a doe or not, and if his these tracks say this is where he's feeding right now, that's a valuable find. If it's out in the woods somewhere or there's nothing important near it, and, or if it's not on a, on a scrape trail, that, that those fresh droppings might not mean much except that you know a big buck lives in this area. But what you, the, the kind of, like with tracks, droppings are, are most valuable as a, as a sign for future hunting when it's near a place where you can count on a buck being during certain hours of day, it, it, a predictable place. Until it, the buck finds you, you know, then you might change matters, but in the beginning, like opening weekend, uh, just a few droppings, like I say, you know, really big ones somewhere that's close to a feeding area can be the best kind of signs you can find we're planning for hunting in the next hunting season. So, droppings are important. Now, you know, deer tracks, we're ta when we're talking about deer tracks, or the hoof lengths, we're talking about measurements that were up to four inches. Sometimes a little more. 
that's a small number, you know. But still, you know, the, the, your chances of misidentifying a buck on the basis of the lengths of his of his uh, tracks are, are very low. Maybe maybe one buck out of fifty, you might be fooled. But that's a small amount, and just because you are not always correct on identifying a buck by his tracks is no reason to say, I don't believe this works or it doesn't work. That, that would be foolish. Uh, all it means is that it, once in a while, uh, that buck you thought was going to be a three and a half year old buck turns out to be a two and a half year old. Or sometimes that buck you thought was going to be a three and a half year old based on his track length turns out to be a huge monster buck or 12 pointer with huge antlers. So it can work either way. Well, the same is true with droppings. Droppings are small measurements. You know, where I hunt, our mature does have droppings a half inch in length. You know, well, when you find a doe puddle of droppings made by a doe, usually they're puddled. They don't have uh, clump droppings. Clump droppings are bucks only. Doe droppings are puddles, you know, individual, easily seen, you know, like beans that have been dumped in the ground, they're kind of scattered there in a puddle. Now when you look at that puddle of doe droppings, and you get down there and look at them and say, well, oh, there's some here that are bigger, like maybe up to five eighths inch. That can be a fuller, you know, in it where I hunt, five eighths inch droppings are made by two and a half year old bucks. And that means any dropping you find in the woods that are five eighths inch or longer, all the way up to a one and a quarter inches in length, believe it or not, are buck dropping. They're droppings made by mature bucks. You, you don't, those are all bucks that make bigger droppings. Half inch or smaller, those are, the, the, the half inch are the mature does, the does that have young, you know. They're, most of them are two, two and a half years of age or older, all the way up to maybe 10 years. But their droppings are fairly uniform in size. But you get down there and you see those droppings there, and oh, here's one that's five inch. Well, don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, that's got to be a two and a half year old buck. What you do is take, measure the most common length. And the most common length where I am, well, it's true from all the way from the Cascade Mountains in Washington, and all the way to, to uh, New York <laughs> State, you know, all this country in between, and Canada. Average droppings are doe droppings, droppings of mature does. And droppings that are or three-eighths of an inch, those are droppings made by yearling does. And they're, you know, about 20, 30 pounds lighter than a, than a mature doe. And then droppings are only about a quarter inch in length. Those are fawn droppings. And some of the, even some of those buck fawns, they'll have clump droppings. It'll be a small clump, and you look at just little quarter inch long droppings. Well, I use a buck fawn for sure, but not for, you know, but there are, there are a lot of buck fawns that won't have clump droppings in the fall. But everything, all, all the bucks older than that all have clump droppings in the fall. Anyway, when you see that puddle of doe droppings, you go with the most common length. You know, 95 percent of them are all this half inch. There'll be some shorter ones in there too. Well, the common length, and it'll be half inch right where we are. It's, we've been doing this so many years. I've been doing this for 50 years. I, you know, I can just look and oh, that's doe droppings without having to put a ruler on them and do a lot of measuring this year when you're out there scouting so you get used to being able to say, oh, that's a doe dropping without having to get down there and measure it because when you're out there hunting, you don't want to be stopping to measure droppings, uh, not during the hunting season. You can do all you want of that before the season, but once the hunting season starts, any time a mature whitetail, whether it's a doe or a buck, sees you really interested in signs they made, you know, the doe sitting over there, it heard you coming or smelled you coming, and oh, they're kind of keeping an eye on you, see what you're doing, and then when you stop and become real interested, you're like a wolf who got real interested in these droppings or these tracks. Uh, 
And when you're really interested, you're telling that doe, you've selected that doe as a as a prey. All of a sudden, you're dangerous when you do that. You don't want that. So get used to them. Do a lot of measuring. But these are important things to know. Another thing, important thing to know is because you're dealing with such small measurements and just an eighth of an inch making a difference between identifying a deer pro properly or not, you aren't going to be quite as accurate at determining what kind of deer made the track as you would with tracks. Tracks, you're, you're more accurate. But one thing you can always count on, like I've already said, if that dropping is five eighths of an inch or longer, it's a buck, a mature buck that made the track. That five eighths is a two and a half year old buck, and if it's up there, if they're an inch long, that's a buck you probably end up taking to a tax bear. That's a dandy buck out there, so keep that in mind. You don't make a mistake if they're five eighths inch or longer. Those are bucks. Those are older bucks. And if it's three eighths or smaller, those are does, <laughs> and and that includes yearling bucks. Does and yearling bucks at half inch. The yearling buck might go uh, a, a, a little bit longer than a half inch, but most of them are half inch. But they get clumps, so you can tell that's a buck that made the trop, the stropping buck. Anyway, so you you'll never be wrong. You know, you, if you spend the rest of your life only hunting bucks based on the dropping sizes, you know, only hunt bucks that have droppings that are, that are longer than five eighths inch, you know, and fresh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You're going to be a buck hunter, a successful buck hunter, so learning what you need to know about droppings is as important as learning what you need to know about track lengths. Uh, it's another little thing that will be a turning point in your hunting in the future, determining that instead of being a hunter who, hit, who takes anything with a white tail, flashing through, you know, you're a hunter who only takes older bucks. And, uh, you know, there come a day, you know, really, honestly, when you do these kind of things, I mean, there's going to be a lot of hunters saying, geez, how do you keep getting bucks like this all the time when they don't even see them? You must have all the bucks in the county in your hunting area. They start thinking, you know, whereas they have as many as you do, but they don't see them, and you do. So that's the difference. But that'll happen. So. Okay, well, let's get down to the nitty gritty of, of, of droppings. You know, I, uh, my son John's going to match up droppings with, with different ages and sizes of deer you know, from fawns all the way up to big dominant breeding bucks in their prime. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things you'll learn, you know, over the years when you're measuring droppings, you're going to find that, you know, you'll find tracks in the immediate area as well. And so the two kind of match up pretty well, you know, you find these half-inch droppings and... Mature doe droppings. Fine dropping. Oh yeah, here's some three inch long tracks over here and here's some uh, two and a quarter inch long. Oh, that's a pond, you know, and they kind of go together, you know. It makes sense, you know. Here we have a three inch track doe. There's smaller tracks here for a yearling. Smaller tracks here for a fawn. Multiple beds over a period of time have flattened this area compared to over there.
And so you, you get to the point where you think, oh, here's some drugs. I don't need to see the tracks. I know what kind of deer are in, like in feeding areas. You know, there's certain areas in the woods when you're, after you've done a lot of this, you'll, you'll start to realize that there's some places where you find lots of droppings. And one can be a fooler, I'll mention that now too, but uh, whitetails, they empty their bowels a lot. I, I don't know why, but boy, it's just going on. And, and since they spend so much time feeding wherever they feed, you're going to see a lot of droppings in the feeding area. That's one of the characteristics of a whitetail feeding area. Lots of droppings off trail, yeah? just on trails, but they're all over the place, you know, where you don't see tracks or anything. There's droppings there, and there's droppings there. And you think, boy, there's sure a lot of droppings in this area. My whitetail sign guides, never seen them before, they look like that. There's 12 cards, they cover 12 different subjects uh, that you need to know something about when you're hunting whitetails. This is one of the more important ones. It's a guide to tell you what kind of deer made dropping. Now we're looking at droppings here. There's a puddle here. Uh, there might be some bigger and some smaller. You go with the average size. You put the card down next to it. Here's some right here. Oh, five eighths inch. <laughs> These are a little older droppings. They aren't as fresh as the ones we just looked at. But they were made by that two and a half year old buck. The only white tail in this country that has five eighths inch droppings is a two and a half year old buck. So oh, let's look for some more. Hey guys, take a look at this. It probably doesn't impress you much, but if this was an antler rub made to mark a breeding range, it would have had to have been made very recently. Uh, between now and November 3rd is when about 90% of buck antler rubs are made. And this one is really dry. But that means it's, it's a velvet rub. And it was made about the 1st of September. That's when the bucks in this part of the country start shedding velvet. And uh, so he was rubbing on here. And while he was rubbing on this side, he was also hitting this, this side of this little clump as well. So there's some spread there. And taking pieces off, and, oh, up here as well. Uh, this could have been some of his tines back on his antlers that were hitting that spot. So, looked to me like a pretty good sized buck removed velvet from his antlers on this little clump of trees. And that's kind of exciting. You see that? You see that big dead pine right back here? The top is all dead up there. Well, the top part fell to the ground just to the right of that, right behind those evergreens. And uh, there's a great big thick trunk there with lots of branches on it. And several trees fell on it and formed a natural blind back in the woods. And a blind like that, that's back in the woods rather than on the edge of a feeding area like this, is it's much more effective uh, especially if you're hunting older bucks, than one that would be right next to the edge of the feeding area. When you're back in like that, you're far less likely to be discovered by a deer out in this feeding area. Here. This is a rather large feeding area, but this looks like a pretty good sized buck. And I noticed some droppings here. I'm going to get my, my dropping guide out. <laughs> Let's check this, see if we can figure this out a little more. Let's see. Oh, they're kind of fresh. They're kind of gooey. They're clumped. Clump droppings are almost always buck droppings. These, most of these droppings are, oh, that's two and it's uh, about five ace. Five ace here. Five ace here. They're five ace. Well, the only buck that makes five ace inch droppings is a two and a half year old buck. So, he, up in this country, he's a six or eight pointer. He'll weigh about 195 pounds live. He's a good sized deer. So, looks like that blind is all set for another good year of hunting. We've had some good hunting here. We've seen lots of deer from that blind over the last three years. Its effectiveness is lasting a lot longer than almost any blind I've ever used. 
and it looks like it's going to be good for another year. Uh, in the year of tough hunting like this, that two and a half year old buck might look really, really good on opening morning or later in the hunt. But uh, we're not going to leave this one alone. But that looks pretty good. You know, this feeding area has got a lot of red osier that I talked about earlier uh, in another clip. But we also have a lot of sugar maples here. Here's some sugar, sugar maple saplings. And um, the whitetails love those stems just as much as the red osier. Actually, this is uh, this uh, clear cut is going on five years old now. And uh, in this country, clear cuts that age are usually just smothered by second growth popple, which whitetails don't eat. It's, uh, the bark is really bitter. But for some reason or another, this section has remained the way you see it and has remained a good feeding area. So uh, this is a gold mine knowing where this is and being able to hunt here. And uh, best hunted from that blind from south wind, when there's south wind blowing. Okay, uh, I'm still looking for evidence of a really big buck. I'm, we're gonna head out in this direction. We're, right now we're gonna be looking for droppings. In this dry soil, the way it looks right now, it'd be hard to find tracks. If there's snow here, we'd see tracks easily. So right now we're depending on droppings. But there's nothing wrong with that. You find great big droppings in the feeding area, you know a big buck is feeding in the feeding area. We know a two and a half year old is feeding in the feeding area. So let's we'll take a look around. There's some more droppings and these are a little more fresh. They look a little larger too. Now let's put this one by this one here. These are clumped. The only way it tells they have clumped droppings are bucks. And they're commonly clumped in the fall. Those don't have clump droppings. You know what? That was that one measures seven A's. Oh, let's see this one down here. In the clump. Three fourths. Well, I think they're an average of three fourths. Now, bucks that have three quarter inch long droppings. Boy, watch an 81 year old man get up. <laughs> Bucks that have three quarter inch long droppings are big bucks. Uh, it might even be one large enough to, to be mounted, put on the wall. This might be a wall hanger. So what have we got here? Well, we got a, a two and a half year old. This one is maybe a three and a half, maybe even a four and a half year old buck. Uh, I don't think he's the really big one that I saw in this area last year. I, that one should be 7 eighths or, or one, one inch droppings. So we'll keep looking. Let's go. Okay, we found some more droppings here. They're pretty small. They tell us more than one thing. These things are about 3 eighths. Uh, 3 eighths could be a yearling doe. I kind of, there's so many smaller droppings in there, I, I think they're fun droppings. I'll tell you about yearling does. Yearling does spend their entire yearling year with their mothers, um, mature does. And fawns, of course, go with mothers as well. We, uh, the wolves in this country kill three out of four of our fawns every year between May when fawns are born, most of them, 85% of them, until about the first of November. And to find some fawn droppings or other signs of fawns is a good thing. Uh, those are, this is the only way we're going to ever see deer numbers recover to numbers that there used to be in this area. So fawn droppings are a good find. But this time of year we only see about one fawn per two adult does. In the spring, last June, there was a twin uh, tracks of twin fawns all over the place. But the thing about that is if that's a yearling doe or a fawn, it's with a mother. And so we're looking at evidence of two deer here. So what have we found so far? We found a three and a half to four and a half year old buck, a two and a half year old buck, his velvet rub over by that stand site. And uh, that's a pretty good number of deer. We're, we're talking about, what, four deer in this specific area. 
and they probably come here a lot to feed. And once they start feeding on browse, boy, there's some neat, there's sugar maple browse right there. But once they start feeding on that, they're gonna be gorging themselves on that twice a day, every day during the month of November and well into December. So, okay, look at that. See how easy scouting is? You know, you don't have to have a tail, a trail that's well worn or a whole bunch of antler rubs to have good hunting. Uh, simple little bits of evidence like this can lead to excellent hunting. We'll go home and think about all these finds and decide how we're going to hunt them and the wind directions we want to come to them and that kind of thing, edge of this clear cut. But I'm thinking about putting a portable blind up here uh, near a place where a buck bedded, big one, last year. And we're going to go check and see if he's around here. Well, we found a huge bed in deep grass. It's obviously a bed of a mature buck. I'm going to do some quick measurement here. It's here. That's one foot. Two foot. Three foot. Well, it's four feet long, easily. That's a big buck. It was probably made by the buck that made those uh, three-quarter inch droppings that we found. That's huge, that's a big animal. Uh, right here, well, here's water right next to me. That's typical. They bed near water, not usually so close. Uh, and uh, of course the area here is full of food for them. That clear cut's got a lot of grass in it in the winter time. And he's got some quick, thick escape areas all around here to run into if a wolf comes along or a hunter wandering around aimlessly. So uh, this looks good. Kind of goes along with those droppings. Darn, you know, you can do a lot of scouting in a year, but it is really hard to find an area. This is about four or five acres with as much buck sign. Doesn't sound look like much buck sign to you, does it? You're used to looking for other things. But we look for beds and droppings and tracks. And that's all you need. Hey guys, you want to see what droppings from a 300 pound northern Minnesota book, buck look like? Take a look at these. See them down here? Look at here's my hand. These things, they are not most, most are much bigger. These things are inch and a quarter long. I haven't seen inch and a quarter for a while, not since our terrible winters a few years ago when we lost so many deer. These are all inch and a quarter long. I'll tell you, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's, those were made by a buck. Oh, the one that I saw in this area last year, he was huge, one of the biggest I've ever seen in my life. Huge, huge buck with a great big throat patch. And um, this tells me he's alive. <laughs> and we're not far from the bedding area where he bedded last year. That's just over this way a little bit. So uh, these, these droppings are, oh, I would say roughly a week old. Um, not much older than that. So those are big. Yeah, you get the buck that makes droppings like that. And you really got a buck of a lifetime. Oh boy. When you find it, you'll also find a lot of droppings in a bedding area. And like I said the last time I talked to you, the uh, first thing when a whitetail stands up from its bedding area, it empties its bowl, so there are droppings there too. And they can kind of tell you, well here's some three little half inch droppings and here's some little quarter inch droppings here and they're all over in this grass here and brush and things. It, when you find that kind of thing and it's not a feeding area and a, you know mixed timber things like that, well you're thinking oh this is a this got to be a, a dull bedding area here which can be important when you're in heat. <laughs> you know Midday, that's where they're going to be, and the big buck's going to be with the doe and hate it midday during the hunting season, if that's when your hunting season occurs. So that's important. So you say, whoa, this is a doe, here's three inch, 
Uh, this is not a feeding area. This is there's no food around here. But they might be deep grasses. They like they like to bed in deep grass because their ponds are so well hidden there. And themselves too, they can put their heads down. You can't see a deer out there. They can raise it a little bit, look around the top of the grasses, look around. You don't see them. Put them down again. You think, well, there's no deer over there. Well, they do that. But anyway, lots of droppings mean something. Now. So, in bedding areas and feeding areas, those are the two places you find most of them. Except on some trails where, you know, there's times of the year like uh, when a buck is maintaining ground scrapes, you know, uh, re they're renewing them every 24 to 48 hours during, between the last two weeks in October. And you can see quite a few droppings made by big bucks, those, those clump droppings along a scrape trail. Uh, so, but anyway, that's just a trail. I mean, off trail you wouldn't find so many. Now, there's another place too, and I learned that quite a few years ago. I remember I found this place out in the woods, and holy cow, there was trails all over and piles of deer droppings all over in this area. I have found the Shangri-La of deer hunting. This is crazy. There must be tons of deer out here. And I remember putting up a tree stand there and I just couldn't wait for the opener and I got out there and sat there all day the first day and never saw a deer. Second day, no deer. Third day, this is crazy. How come there's all these signs here? Well, lots of droppings like that off trail or on trail uh, are a sign of a wintering area. You know, and they aren't in wintering areas during hunting seasons, normally. Unless uh, you got a really deep snow and deer have migrated early to their wintering area. But, so, when you're out there, if you find a place that's just loaded, I mean, just unbelievable amount of droppings all over the place. Trails, well-worn trails. You're probably looking at a wintering area, and there will be no deer there during the hunting season. So, keep that in mind. Okay. Now, let's talk about droppings for individual deer. I've already kind of went over it pretty quick here, you know. Uh, droppings of a fawn in this northern part of the United States and Canada are about a quarter inch long. Just little, little short things. And like I said, sometimes a, a buck fawn will even have clump droppings. And I believe, and I've had arguments with people about this, uh, veterinarians for one, about why those clump droppings are clumped in the fall. And I think it's because of, well, sexual excitement, you know, all this business about and battling with other bucks and all the things that go into uh, that into a buck's life during the period be before and while breeding is in progress. And I think, you know, that affects their ball movements. I think they get sort of a, of a diarrhea <laughs> out here, but I, the, the droppings, instead of being, you know, nice nicely formed little dropping, you know, little bean-shaped things with little ovens at the end laying on the ground. They're real soft and they stick together in the fall because of this. And so I think that's why it happens. But whether it does or not, it happens. <laughs> anyway, so, so quarter inch, that's pretty simple. Well, one thing about that, you know, if you're out there scouting in October and you find some quarter inch long droppings, we're in a doe. There's a doe living here. Whether you see the doe's tracks are dropping or not, there's a doe. Maybe she hides that fawn there while she's feeding. Uh, either way, or maybe it's big enough now so it goes with her to the feeding area, and fawns fill up their 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 stomachs much more quickly than older deer, and so fawn gets kind of bored out there while mother's feeding, and they'll lay down. You'll find little beds. 30, 36 inches long out there in the grass in a feeding area. And that's 
another thing that can be characteristic of a whitetail feeding rift. But you find that those kind of droppings out there, wherever you find them, there's a female deer around here somewhere, an older and a mature doe here. So you already know, there's a doe here. There might be others too, you know, might be a, a yearling doe and a yearling buck also in the immediate area. So, but that might be your first clue of such a thing. Things to know, you know? So anyway, yeah. not much else to know about fawn droppings. Then the next, the next biggest deer is the yearling doe. It's kind of funny, you know, when when fawns are born, the doe fawns are a little bit bigger than the buck fawns, and uh, I don't know why. I, maybe it's nature's way of making sure the the deer that produce young in the future uh, start out life a little bit better than the bucks. The bucks aren't quite as important. They only need a a fraction, 10% of bucks out there to be able to, to have breeding going on and to reproduce fawns every year. But they start out a little, big, a bit, little bit bigger than the bucks. Well, it isn't long after they're born when the bucks start to overtake. They, they're bigger animals. They grow to be bigger animals. And by the time they're yearlings, uh, our yearling does weigh about 120 pounds live, and by that time, our yearling bucks are weighing 140 to 150 pounds. They're the size of a mature doe, you know. So, anyway, so they're a little small, and they're three eighths of an inch. So, that's that's simple enough, and and there again, you know, you find three inch tracks. Well, there's got to be a an uh, older doe around here somewhere. We're in a doe range. How about that? Yeah. We're in a doe range. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that this is not, you're not going to find bucks in this range later on. Uh, you know, when breeding begins, yearling does have their first heat. They breed as yearlings, uh, as yearlings and bear young for the first time as two-year-olds the following spring. Uh, so when does are in heat, yearling does are in heat as well as the older does. So, yeah. so that's probably as important as in that regard as, as, as the anthers droppings of the older does. But for some strange reason, the older does, when they, they'll get up to a certain plateau when they're about two, two and a half years of age. And they don't gain weight particularly after that. Well, some do. Some get really fat, you know, they look huge. And there are does that will weigh 170 pounds. But that's kind of unusual. Most of them pretty much plateau, you know, at this time. And their tracks don't get any bigger, their droppings don't get any bigger. All those things are pretty stable after that. So, but, so, the, Third, the half-inch droppings, like I said, are droppings typical of our mature does. And where all year round, everywhere you go, you can have pre-season, after, uh, during the season, wherever. Those half-inch droppings always mean they were made, especially they're shiny, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but they were made by a mature doe or a yearling buck, about the same size as a yearling doe. Well, here we go, some fairly fresh sign. I'd say this is no more than two days old. It's all mature doe size, half inch size droppings, and uh, that's good to hear. That's good to find. This area has been devoid of deer for about four years now. Well, it's to be the fourth year. And it's good to see they're back. Now, this is a doe that lives in this area. And we should expect to find three inch tracks and half inch droppings in this area during the hunting season, uh, beginning about three weeks from now. And um, when this doe is in estrus, uh, and sure, there will be a big buck with her, and so we're looking forward to seeing big buck signs in this area. But it's always good 
when you're hunting bucks, be close to does. Because anytime you're next to one or near one that's in estrus, you're almost certain to get a shot at a really big buck, biggest buck in the square mile. So, anyway, I like that sign. That's, that's the best I've seen in this area now in some years. So this area is coming back. Over here, <laughs> we got something that goes along with that, those dough droppings. But look at the ground here. It's very difficult to see tracks. It's time of the year when uh, us Nordbergs depend on droppings more than tracks. Now that, those droppings are buck droppings, obviously. Look at the little flies on, <laughs> on there. They're fresh. Now, most of these are close to three quarters of an inch in length, these dro individual droppings. And that means this was made by a buck at least three and a half years of age. He's a nice buck. He's the kind of buck that most hunters would never pass up. A yearling buck lives on its mother's range throughout its yearling year, but it explores off range more and more as time goes on. But you know, like before, like I said before, yearling buck droppings will be clumped at, in the fall. So, clump droppings, half inch longer yearling buck. So clump droppings, about three eighths inch, maybe a few half inch, but that's pretty small. So that's probably a yearling buck. Uh, it's not, this sign here is not particularly uh, fresh. I'd say it's at least two or three weeks old. But it's clumped, it's uh, droppings of a yearling buck. See those droppings are all about half inch in length, which would be the same length as, uh, as the droppings of a mature doe, about the same size. But what makes the difference is that this is clumped and only bucks have clump droppings and so this is a buck, this is buck dropping. Okay, now, so now you know about yearling bucks and, and doe. Now the good part starts. Then. Now you want to hunt older bucks. Well, when a, a buck becomes a two-year-old, in the fall he's a two-and-a-half-year-old buck in the fall. By that time, uh, the, they'll get to be much bigger animals than the, than the does. They're, by that time, most of the, our two-and-a-half-year-olds are weighing in the, in the area of around 195 pounds. The bigger two-and-a-half-year-old bucks will be 195 pounds. Now we're looking at droppings here. There's a puddle here. Uh, there might be some bigger and some smaller. You go with the average size. You put the card down next to it. Here's some right here. Oh, five eighths inch. <laughs> These are a little older droppings. They aren't as fresh as the ones we just looked at, but they were made by that two and a half year old buck. The only white tail in this country that has five eighths inch droppings is a two and a half year old buck. And then, you know, bucks have a range of sizes for each year that they're alive, uh, like humans, you know. Uh, there can be quite a difference between humans of the same age. Well, whitetails aren't as variable that way, but the bucks are to, to a certain point. So I can get up in those upper ranges. Some of those big dominant breeding bucks might only weigh, oh, 300 or 250 pounds. And some might weigh 305 pounds live where we hunt. So you can get quite a range in there. But anyway, this thing really takes off. If, you're, if you think two and a half buck, half year old bucks are big enough, and uh, they aren't huge, usually they're, they're, the base of their antlers are only like three quarters of an inch across in diameter. Uh, and uh, there's six to eight pointers where we hunt. Some of them are five pointers. We get some, these uh, irregular sizes of, on different antlers and our bucks a lot where we hunt, which is kind of exasperating at times. You know, you get 
beautiful, big, three or five pound buck. The dominant breeding, and he weighs 305 pounds, but only the eight pointer. Boy, he's got heavier beams for sure, but. And then we can get a, another one, uh, maybe he weighs 285 pounds. You can then, boy, he's a 12 pointer. <laughs> It was a big, and, and the bases of the antlers are well over an inch across. Some of them get to be two inches even, you know, big bases on those antlers. But anyway, if you want to hunt bigger bucks, then you don't pay much attention to 5 8 inch droppings. But don't con it in that being absolutely accurate. We've taken some nice three and a half year old bucks, you know, when it gets to be a three and a half year old, He's got some nice antlers, kind of nice spreads and long tines. And the bases are only on a three and a half year old, or usually only where we hunt are about an inch across, you know, an inch in diameter. Uh, but lots of antlers, and lengths, and, you know, thinner antlers than when they're older. But we've taken some three and a half year old bucks that had only five eighths inch long droppings, so it can vary. Most of them, most three and a half year old bucks, now we're getting into the bigger ones here now, will have droppings at least three quarters of an inch in length. Three quarters. And if you want to hunt big bucks, big bucks you would like to, that you probably want to have mounted, <laughs> hunt bucks that make droppings three quarters of an inch longer and longer. Okay. Well, we just got started scouting here for the first time in October 2017. Going up the hill here, ran across this track. The hoofs are spread here a little bit, but this hoof print goes from here to here. It almost looks like it's more than four inches, which would be the biggest I've ever seen up here in this country. It's a good, the toe goes right there. It's a good, the hoof itself is a good 10 centimeters long. We'll convert that to inches when I get back to camp, but that is a huge buck. In the old days, I used to measure them from tip to dew claw. Here's the dew claw measurement. And I always thought six inches was really big, but here we got two, three, four. We got four, 40 centimeters. <laughs> that is one heck of a big buck. Uh, we'll convert that to inches, and that's fairly fresh. It's sunk down in the mud quite a bit. There he has toes spread apart to keep from sinking deeper. At least the three and a half to four and a half year old boy that made these droppings. Yeah, but uh, these are these are pretty sizable drop. <laughs> what we got here. These are, uh, yeah, they're three quarter inch. Uh, here I got two, two and a third centimeters. I'll have to remember that when we get back to camp. But anyway, that would be a great buck to have <laughs> behind camp opening morning. This is a second buck. This is not the tra uh, droppings from that big track we just looked at a little bit ago down the hill here. This is another one, these are older. I say one to two weeks old. It's rained a bit up here in that time. But uh, this is a pretty decent buck. He's an eight or 10 pointer with maybe one inch diameter bases on his antlers. A nice buck, could be 10 points. You wouldn't pass him up if I get a chance. But that great big one, that's something else. But. What a deal we got here. We got two nice adult bucks on this hill to hunt this fall. <laughs> and this is only, we're only getting started here. So 
that's absolute evidence of a really nice mature buck right here. And that track down there is absolute evidence of a really big trophy class buck. <laughs> so we've got two of them here. Wherever you find droppings an inch or more in length, inch is a big buck. I mean that buck is at least a four and a half to six and a half year old buck. You might, we find, occasionally find bucks that have droppings as long as inch and a quarter. They're kind of unusual. We don't usually see them that long. That's, that's an unusual size, but boy, when you see them, that, that buck is on our mind constantly with those droppings until the hunting season begins. Oh man, we want to take this buck. Hey guys, you want to see what droppings from a 300 pound Northern Minnesota buck look like? Take a look at these. See them down here? Look at here's my hand. These things, they are not most, most are much bigger. These things are inch and a quarter long. I haven't seen inch and a quarter for a while, not since our terrible winters a few years ago when we lost so many deer. These are all inch and a quarter long. I'll tell you, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's, those were made by a buck, oh, the one that I saw in this area last year, he was huge. One of the biggest I've ever seen in my life. Huge, huge buck with a great big throat patch. And um, this tells me he's alive. <laughs> and we're not far from the bedding area where he bedded last year. That's just over this way a little bit. So uh, these, these droppings are, oh, I would say roughly a week old. Um, not much older than that. So, those are big. Yeah, you get the buck to make droppings like that, and you really got a buck of a lifetime. Oh boy. Now, what is, so, anytime you find dropping seven eighths inch or longer, you're in the ballpark for seeing big bucks. And if, and if you're always hunting close to where you find those out where they're really fresh, every half day you hunt, you're going to be seeing a lot more big bucks than you've ever seen in your life in the woods during a hunting season. I'm not saying you're going to want to see 20 of them, no. You might only see three or four really big ones during the hunting season, but how many do you need to see? I mean, one is enough if you're a great shot and you're in control of things when one like that is close to where you're sitting. Oh, in other words, you're able to get off a good, accurate shot. Don't get overly excited. You know, when you start seeing more big bucks in the woods for a while there, <laughs> you're going to get awfully excited each time you see one. Holy cow, look at that. And all of a sudden you aren't shooting worth a darn. You know, you're shooting offhand, you're not taking a nice rest, you're not taking time, you're, you're not centering that cross those cross hairs in your scope right where you want to put that buck down, like, <laughs> you know, where it'll drop in its tracks when you pull the trigger, you're not, you're not being careful about it. You're just so darn excited, you can, and your hands are shaking, and your legs are shaking. That's why it's good to sit down when you fire a gun or a ball, to be sitting down. You get those shaky knees out of it, <laughs> and press your gun against a, a tree trunk or branch or whatever. Uh, or elbow even over here on one side, that helps to get everything steady there, you know. And then take a deep breath and let half of it out and hold and pow. Now, you're going to be good, <laughs> but you're going to be excited in the beginning when you start seeing a lot of these bucks, so keep that in mind. But when you, when you, if you're not finding big tracks, droppings that are seven eighths inch or longer, and shiny are the drops you want. You know, you want them to be like tracks. You want them to be fresh. With tracks, you got nice, clear, well-defined edges on the tracks and anatomy underneath where it both touches the ground, that kind of thing. But with droppings, freshness is determined by how shiny they are. If they're shiny, you know, that means they're moist on the outside. And when they're moist on the outside, they're not long out of the deer. 
uh, if it, in warm weather they dry, the droppings start drying out pretty rapidly. And if you if they're dull, if they are they are dull in appearance, they're not shiny on the outside. That's an old dropping. Old droppings like old deer tracks are old news. Uh, they don't necessarily they don't necessarily have a lot of uh, hunting value. But you know, like say in a feeding area, if you're finding a whole lot of droppings that are an inch long, and some are shiny and some are dull. You know, the dull ones tell, wow, this buck has been coming out here for a while. You know, dull dropping means this, this buck has been feeding in this area for quite a while. Same way with a deer trail. Here's, boy, here's fresh droppings made by a big buck, and here's old ones. Well, boy, this is a favorite of that buck. <laughs> And that's that is important. That's that has some value. Old droppings have value in that case. So keep that in mind. Now, now when you find clump droppings, it seems like those drops can be all mashed together, and most of them. You just can't make head or tail of how long they are, but it's still important to be able to recognize the lengths in a clump, in a clump, a clump droppings pressed together. So to be really accurate about what buck made those clump droppings, you should measure droppings, and you should measure some that have not been greatly changed in in shape. It might be a little bit flattened, but not greatly changed in shape and put your ruler on there. Now, you we're dialing with eighths of an inch differences in here, you know. You put a ruler on there and it's five eighths is the average size. There might be some that pressed out so they're an inch and a half long. That's, that's no good. But one that got most of its original shape there. If it's five eighths, well, that's two and a half year old buck. Uh, so, you, you, wanna, you don't want to be mistaken here. Put all your marbles into some clump droppings that appear to be much bigger than they are and turn out to be a smaller buck. But pretty much the original shape there, oh, this one here is seven eighths or three quarters even. That's a big buck. That's the kind you want. And like I say, measure a lot of droppings in the fall. You'll see plenty of clump droppings in the wood. Measure them. Get down there. Don't handle them with your fingers. Just get down and put your ruler next to them or your your sign guides, you know, a lot. actually, boy, you guys have been buying my sign guides a lot lately, and I appreciate that. And you're going to appreciate it too. That you put that on there, you get pretty. Yeah, that's just as good as any ruler you can buy. That's a way to measure that that dropping, the dropping line. So measure that. Get used to it. So when the hunting season comes, you can walk through the woods without stopping, and you look over there and you see these clump drums, and say, oh yeah, that's a big one, boy. That, that thing has got to be three quarters an inch. It's probably longer. Those are longer than that. You got that's got to be, got to be instantly in your mind when you see them, and you just keep going because if they're really shiny, that buck could be right over there, and you can't see him right over there, and he's watching you and listening to you going by. You don't want him to see you get really interested in those droppings like wolves will do when they don't want a deer to run away before they get a chance to set up their special little hunts like they do in our hunting where, where our big gray wolves hunt whitetails all the time. So, don't want that to happen. So get used to measuring and get used to estimating their length by, without having to stop. So anyway, that's, those are good things to know. So anyway, fresh droppings are shiny droppings. Dull droppings are old droppings. One of the things I should mention here is that uh, whereas clump droppings are always buck droppings, not all bucks have clump droppings in the fall. I don't know why that is. <laughs> Some of the biggest bucks out there will have really big droppings and they aren't clumped. They'll be in a puddle like that. Uh, most of the ones I've seen that way, most of the ones that are, that are puddled like that seem to be kind of old, you know. So maybe they were made before the buck started having 
clump drop it. So, but you never know. I was in skying in the spring. You don't see many clump droppings in the spring. They're mostly individuals, you know, individual droppings in a puddle made by bucks. And, and in my hunting area, we used to find, we had an area where we commonly found drop, buck dropping inch and eighth long. And uh, sometimes I'd look at one of those and I think it looks like two droppings fused together, you know, to make them that long. And maybe that's what the deal was. But I remember guys in my hunting school, where they'd find those and then we'd get back to the classroom and they couldn't wait to show them to me and look at these. <laughs> and so a lot of them were that kind where two droppings were fused together. But if you find a puddle and they're all that length, well, that's really something, you know. Another thing to mention about buck droppings is that you can use these lengths to figure out approximately how many mature bucks you got in a square mile, you know, and you can go over another square mile and go through that and start all over again, you know, just by lengths of droppings, what you've got out there as far as bucks are concerned. Now, one of the things we've learned too over the years is that you can have a buck over here that's making three, seven, eight inch long droppings, just an example. And, and uh, he can come over here, and here's another, here's some more seven eighths inch droppings. But those don't have the diameter, or, you know, they, they aren't as wide across in the middle as the ones we found over there. And as try as I can, I can only come to one conclusion based on all the years of doing this sort of thing. That, when you find some seven eighths inch droppings over there that are kind of almost egg shaped, and you find some seven eighths inch over here that are kind of longer or not as big around in the middle, those are two big bucks. Those are separate bucks. And it always has worked out that way. So, you know, in a square mile, you can have some lesser bucks, bucks that were beaten up by the big dominant breeding buck. You know, it can be pretty large bucks and have droppings and tracks every bit the same size as, dropping, uh, as uh, tracks and droppings made by the big dominant breeding buck. And I, I've taken bucks like that. They, they were in their temporary home ranges after being run off by the big dominant buck that were really big bucks, like a 12-pointer, for example. And, uh, but when you find different diameters, you know, maybe egg-shaped there and long and there over there, that's two big bucks. That, that seven-eighths inch tells you that's a really big buck, or one inch or whatever. That's a really big buck. And these are two different bucks in this same square mile. Oh, that can be an exciting thing. You can, you just think of it, two great big trophy class bucks like that in the one mile that you're hunting. You do things right that improves your odds by 100% of seeing really a big one out there. So uh, those are good things to know. So. Yeah, my son John just reminded me about another thing here, about droppings, you know. You know when you find clump droppings in the woods, you know, you're out there and you'll, you know, you know they, they might be this long and they might be broken up a little bit, falling apart when they hit the ground. 
But you'll see some that seem like, you know, they're long and, and skinny, you know, and then you'll find some that are bigger and bigger around, and you can't help but think that, geez, big bucks, bigger, the biggest bucks have the largest opening, <laughs> anus, uh, larger, and so his clumps would be, would, it would be logically larger in diameter than clumps of younger deer. And this is true, or smaller bucks. They might be the same age, but it might be a smaller buck in one case. That's true, you know. But, you know, in all the years I've been measuring droppings, me and measuring diameters of clumps, I've never been able to come up with a reliable measurement and the reliable measurements for diameter of clumps. It just was too scattered, you know, different sizes and so forth, where I'll readily admit, boy, that big clump, that clump, that bigger around is probably a really big buck compared to the one over here that isn't as big around. I will go as far as to say that. But I can't tell you exactly what age that thing was. The bigger one ate well, he was probably four and a half to six and a half years of age, like bucks are. That's when they're in their prime. Six and a half in the wilds are starting to go downhill a little bit, not quite the lengths on their antlers, but they still have plenty of bulk, lots of big diameter on tines and bases and that kind of thing. But they're starting to go downhill now. As far as antlers concerned, that doesn't mean their bodies are getting smaller, or their hoofs, or, or the droppings, or the size of the diameters, or their, their uh, clumps are getting smaller. But you can have differences. You know, you can have a four and a half year old buck with, with one inch droppings, and a six and a half year old buck with uh, three quarter inch droppings, and vice versa, you know. So there's differences there, but when you get up into those sizes of bucks, you know, little variances in length uh, don't always tell you the story. Like, you know, you might say, anytime you find three quarter inch droppings, those are three, likely a three, just say likely, it's not always absolutely true. That's almost certain that buck is a three and a half year old. Anything bigger, seven eighths or bigger, it's almost certain that buck is four and a half to six and a half years old. They they don't when they get to those age groups in their prime, they don't get bigger. Skeletal wise, if each deer's hoofs don't get bigger during that period, they might even get a little shorter. You know, you can measure them in the spring. You know, hoofs are constantly growing, but the edges, you know, where most of the growing is going on, that form the edges of the trap, that they keep getting worn down. You know, when they're running and walking and moving in, and in the, and hard soil, sand, rock, whatever. There's constant wear going on on the edges of those hoofs. And, but when it comes time to start making ground scrapes, and if your ground is um, rocky, or one of those limestone bluffs, you know, like in western Wisconsin, where big bucks live, and they're doing a lot of pine, and some big bucks will have as many as 30 ground scrapes in its home rent. I'll be talking about this later on, too. And they're going to want to renew that thing. Well, when they renew a ground scrape, they want to make it look like it's freshly made. So when other bucks come along and they see this, and oh, he's, he's, he's probably close. I better get out of here because he already ran me out of here, and I don't want to be here in trouble with this guy because he'll beat the daylights out of me. And he's so, now his testosterone levels are so high, and he's just ferocious and come at him. So anyway. Uh, he can bellow and come after me with his head down. I don't want to be around him now. But anyway, you got a buck that's got a big 
range and he's got a lot of ground scrapes and he's one of the things I always do is paw the ground some more. You know, kick some dirt and leaves and sod and away from that area. So I got a nice patch and it, the patch gets bigger, you know, type. It might be only a uh, big buck's ground scrape might only be a couple of feet the first time, and sometimes even just a, a foot in diameter at first, but you see sod or leaves or grass or whatever kick way over there, 10, 20 feet away. Huge, you know, uh, distances. When that's a buck with temper. Oh boy, he's, uh, <laughs> he's really pawing hard. Hey, buck hunters, <laughs> take a look at this scrape. Uh, today is the 21st of October up here in Minnesota. That means it's 14 days yet until breeding begins. Uh, but look at the size of the scrape. And look at the chunks of moss that have been kicked way over there when the buck was pawing the scrape. But well, all this pawing that's going on is putting wear on the tips of his paws, you know, and they, pretty soon they aren't so sharp. And you see them, the tip. Uh, when you see this footprint, the same buck that made longer hoof pits the spring, the same buck later on, you know, like in, during the hunt, hunting season, uh, they can be more, more blunt at the tip. They look almost heart-shaped then, you know, heart-shaped hoofs, but wide, either way out here. I've never found a good correlation between widths either because whitetail hoofs are, are in two parts. They're bilateral and then in soft soils. They can spread their hoofs quite a bit, and so that one buck you can measure his track, the same buck, and it might be just one lift, and you see it a little in another place. Made by the same buck maybe an hour later, and it's a lot narrow, and you think that's not, you think, oh boy, there's two bucks here, but that isn't, I couldn't find a good correlation on widths either. But I know I've seen plenty of those blunt, heart hit ones in the woods that a lot of width. And I go, oh, this is a really good sized buck. But generally, they, even with that, on a really big buck, they, the length is still going to be out there uh, uh, close to four inches on a really big one, but kind of blunt in the front for that reason. So that can be different. Now, one thing, you know, like with tracks, and weights of deer. The further south you go in America, the smaller the deer become. You know, it's warmer, warmer. The, the big deer don't do as well in, in warm climates, and climate change is going to have an effect on them from this way for sure. But uh, the big deer really do well, much better in cold weather than the smaller deer do. So yeah, there's a this there's a reason why bigger sizes become the deer that survive better in winter than, than deer that in the deep south where they don't have that kind of weather. So there's a difference. So droppings are likely to be different in sizes too. Further south you go, like if you hunt in Tennessee or Texas or uh, or or Georgia, places like that, you're going to want to be able to figure out what sizes of droppings should be for the area you hunt. You'll find those on page 178 in my 10th edition. That, that's your source. Here, here's, this tells you how to go about figuring out what sizes of droppings match up with the deer in your hunting area. So, like with traps, that's important to be able to do that. And these formulas were developed just for that purpose. After I've been <laughs> measuring droppings all over this country for so long, I came up with these formulas. And they'll give you very close to proper length of the deer where you hunt, wherever you hunt. And uh, so, uh, but in each case, you know, wherever, whether it's tracks or drops, you start out while scouting, finding a mature doe with young. You know, after, you have to wait till after May, uh, the middle of May, when when 85 percent of, of fawns are born in this country, to find tracks of a deer, probably tracks uh, in the neighborhood of three inches in length, or maybe a little shorter where you hunt. Maybe they're two and a half where you hunt. And here's tra little tracks accompanying that those bigger tracks. Well, that's your starting point. So, 
Gerd, you got a doe with young. So that doe is, his track length is the starting point. Uh, if you find several of them, you, you might find that there's a difference between the tracks of, of does with young. And that, that the reason is, uh, yearling does, you know, they're, they're older when they have their, their young in the spring, might not have fully that full three inch length to their tracks yet. And uh, so there's differences. And uh, so if you find differences in track lengths between a deer that have fawns, go with the bigger track, because the smaller one might be that of, of, a, of a, a doe that's had her baby for the first time in her life. You know? And that also down south, like, uh, Common, more common in Iowa than in Minnesota. Fawns down there because of all the corn they eat, and because they actually have some larger deer there. I've, we, my wife has found tracks of. Well, I was putting on seminars, deer hunting seminars for a big archery group there. I was finding tracks uh, made by deer that were almost five inches long, and I've never seen. Oof, Lengths that long for a for a deer or a buck in a, anywhere anywhere else in the United States. So there's some bigger deer there, but at any rate, uh, so with the with the doe, go with the the bigger the the biggest deer and the bigger deer that's with a fawn. If, if you find different lengths, and start with that, and you plug in those measurements, the the dropping lengths and uh, in this case, made by a doe with a, with a young, or hoof lengths in the case of hoofs, and use that in the formula provided on another page that I've talked about before. But that's your starting point, and using these formulas, uh, you plug that in and you can figure out exactly how long the droppings are for all the other deer in your hunting area. Good to know. And what wonderful information that gives you. How much more you know about where to hunt during the coming hunting season when you when you can do this kind of thing to figure out what kind of deer made what droppings. But anyway, now you have another tool <laughs> to make you a regularly successful buck hunter. Droppings. A, a valuable tool. Sometimes the only tool you get before a season begins. So don't, you know, Keep your, when you're out there, it's going to keep your eyes peeled or hunting, eyes peeled for droppings as well as hoof prints. Uh, they can be every bit as valuable, if not more so in some situations, as hoof prints. So, uh, that's part of your ammunition now for being a buck hunter. And you always want to key, you know, like with hoof prints, Droppings that have, are the most, have the most value of uh, shiny ones when they're really close to places where you know you can count on a big buck returning. You know, he made those droppings earlier and is he going to come back here? Well, if he doesn't get alarmed in the meanwhile by some way and chased and made to abandon his range or made to abandon this feeding area by you, or another hunter, you you can do it just by stopping your hunting season to look at those tracks or droppings or measure them. Just that alone, without you realizing it, can ruin it. I mean, that buck might be a long way away, but he's laying where he can keep an eye on that feeding area. And he's, he's down here getting all excited about tracks or droppings. That's going to that might be enough to make that this that buck to say, I'm not going back there as long as there's humans or well, there's a human mess around that feeding area. So, no. But anyway, now you got some more ammunition that improves your odds of taking big bucks even more. You know, when you can put droppings into this, I'm uh, selecting and preparing or whatever, very little preparing stand sites. So oh, we'll be talking about that too <laughs> later on. Traction droppings are great. We'll talk about other things like um, uh, beds and uh, uh, bed lengths and uh, things like 
antler rubs and brown scrapes and those things, evidences of feeding, things like that. We'll be talking about those as we go along here in this little nitty gritty series. But uh, I've told you about all I can tell you now about droppings. So with that, it's time to end this seminar. <laughs> now, you, you guys take care now with this. Don't take chances with this coronavirus. I don't, I don't want any of you to die <laughs> or get extremely sick. Uh, stay, you know, stay hold up. Uh, stay away from crowds, especially all the things they tell you. Uh, uh, so you can enjoy some more hunting seasons and, and learn how much fun it is to be a regularly successful buck hunter. Uh, so, yeah, take care. Now, remember now, uh, when you, before you leave, uh, press, poke that subscribe button, cost you nothing, but it's good for me you know, on YouTube. You know, it's a, a way that I become even more highly regarded by YouTube <laughs> as a speaker, you know. I'm pretty highly regarded now when you think of it, by having well over a million people, uh, more, way over a million visits on my, on my uh, YouTube channel. And uh, every day now, it's going up quickly now. I mean, just a little bit ago, I was talking about 1,014,000, now all of a sudden it's 1,017,000. So thanks guys for watching, and uh, and you'll thank me too. I, a lot of you already have for what it, all these seminars are doing for you and your deer hunting in the future. And uh, so, uh, and while you're while you're laying around, if you can swing it, really, get this new book. And I know it's expensive. It's thirty four ninety five, and I wish it could be less. I've got it down to a point now where it doesn't pay for me to be selling them in bookstores. And <laughs> I wouldn't make any money then. I have to give bookstore owners a cut then when that happens. So all my sales are on the internet and uh, they've been pretty good. I'm, I'm really happy about that. Uh, now when everybody's being a little bit wondering if they should be really saving our money because of what's happening in the stock market and that kind of thing, well I can understand that too. But if you can swing it, get your book, <laughs> and you'll be forever glad you had it. And uh, all this information I'm going to give you is in here and then some. And then, also before you check out, poke that thumbs up button very well too, will you please? It is saying that you liked what you heard today. Uh, that's as important as subscribe, believe it or not. So that, that improves my regard. <laughs> Uh, by YouTube, so do that, please. And uh, so with that, uh, thanks for watching, guys. And I'm not sure when I'm going to get back. You know, we're kind of getting used to how we're going to continue making these seminars during the, this period when that dangerous flu bug is around. But uh, I, I'll figure out one way or another how we're going to do this in the future. But anyway, uh, thanks again. And so. We'll see you as soon as we can. And uh, now you got plenty to work with here. <laughs> you know, all the seminar, you can go back through them all now. I have more time to do that. And, uh, and they go back quite a ways. Uh, so, uh, thanks again, guys. Bye now. Take care. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account. My Amazon store with links to my ebooks. My son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries. My website bookstore, and much more.